All right, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about tree selection. Um, this is uh, an important co concept and conversation that I have with a lot of people during this time of the year. Um, one of the things that I always get asked is what is the best tree for my site? And the question is, it really depends. Selection impacts the success of um, pretty much any tree planting. So matching the site with the species is critically important when it comes to choosing that, that tree planting and the tree planting protocol. So it'll affect the long-term benefits and inputs of the trees, for, basically for the life of the tree. So one of the reasons why we plant trees is primarily for the benefits. And we've learned over the years that uh, basically what happens is we have a degrading climate. We have a degrading environment. And Indiana ranks around 46 out of the 50 states as far as air and water quality. And it's primarily because of deforestation. All of these ecosystem services that you see on the screen here are very important parts of the trees that we often don't think about. Um, oftentimes we think about the aesthetic properties, whether it flowers or has fall color, things like that. But one of the things that research has shown is it is specifically increases property value from anywhere to five to 20%. It's an economic generator. People want to shop more. They want to stay around longer wherever there are trees that are providing some shade. They certainly provide some environmental um, impacts that are critical to, to our quality of life. Um, especially for climate modifications and those important air and water fil filters, removing air pollution, uh, carbon sequestration, all of those things are very, very important um, when, it comes to, when it comes to tree selection and the important part of trees. But the problem is Tree planting is really a challenge. I mean, it's a tough neighborhood out there. And unfortunately, um, it's really not, trees aren't really meant for the built environment. Um, it's an ecosystem unlike any other because it's dynamic, it's fragmented, it's highly pressured, um, it's consistently under siege. There's continual destruction and disruption to its environment. Soil conditions are horrible. They're often compacted. Um, as opposed to a more natural wooded um, ecosystem. But it's no wonder trees survive at all. Um, basically poor, so the so poor soil structure and limited soil volume. You'll see in the upper left corner there, the picture of the uh, bricks and the, um, and the uh, poor soils there. That was a, um, a planting site in Indianapolis. And that's typically what you find in some locations, especially in the urban area. Um, we found bricks, we found swords, we found knives, um, we found lots of different types of debris that aren't necessarily beneficial to plants. And so that's the reason why we need people more and better informed about how to tr plant trees in a harsh environment. Also, some, pl some planting spaces aren't just suitable or sustainable um, for the location. Um, just like I tell, used to tell my daughter, now she's old enough to tell her kids this now, but just because you can doesn't mean that you should. And that works for tree planting as well. In the bottom left corner there, you'll see um, that's a Kentucky coffee tree planted in that small, that small lawn strip. Well, they get pretty big and you can see my water bottle there in the bottom corner. Well, that's what kind of disruption or infrastructure conflicts do you think we're going to have there? Um, basically, we're going to, we can ruin the curb, damage the street, damage the sidewalk. So it's a wonder why some people really, especially city administration, get upset about tree planting. In the upper right corner, same thing. That's a 26 inch lawn strip and they planted a bunch of red maples in there. We all know how big maple trees get. Is that a sustainable location or is it even suitable to keep that tree healthy and alive? So unfortunately, those trees are, are, will decline very quickly. Back to, the, back to the major question. So what is the purpose for planting? 
And I always tell people you should plan before you plant. If you know why you're planting the tree, this helps tremendously with what to plant. Is what function will it serve? If we look at those ecosystem services and all the things that trees provide other than just being pretty, then we can determine what best fits or perhaps the arborist or the planner or the designer can help determine exactly what will work in that, in that location. Are there aesthetic effects that are important? Uh, functional role, is it going to frame the house or perhaps a block a, a view of the neighbors or provide a windbreak. If we know what, what the design of the plant is and the function or purpose for the planting, that helps us decide a little better about what type of plant that we want to choose, especially when it comes to size, uh, both um, width and height as well. We also have to consider the environmental part of it. So what kind of light conditions are we gonna have? Um, just recently, I've, I've had a couple of requests for what kind of tree should I plant in my front yard? And the list that they were looking at were uh, red bud and dogwood. Well, dogwood is one of the worst trees you could plant in the front yard because where do we typically see those types of trees? We typically see them at wood's edge where they get at least partial shade during the day. So if you plant those trees out in the open lawn where there's lots of sun, lots of transpiration, lots of moisture loss, then the tree's going to scorch. I'm sure we've all seen dogwood leaves where they're scorched on the edge of their leaves. And that's because basically they're just they're just drying or wilting because of the lack of moisture, suitable moisture, and exposure to the sun. We can also sometimes plant some trees in microclimates, trees that may not be so hardy to the an open, open grown area might do well in sort of a protected area. Um, so we see that oftentimes in, in the southern part of our state and even, even a little further, you might be able to plant like crepe myrtles in some protected areas. Now, that doesn't guarantee that they're hardy, but sometimes they can survive. So sun exposure, wind tunnels. I know on Purdue campus, if you walk between some buildings, you come around the corner and the wind just shrinks down to a very small tube and it can actually just blow your hat off. Well, that's the type of wind that also desiccates leaves on trees as well. You can also have heat sinks like you see here. Um, this poor honey locust is really stressed out for a lot of reasons. One, not enough soil volume because of the small planting space. And also it's basically covered on all sides with impervious surface. And so as, as a result, it really doesn't get a lot of moisture. And also, also the radiant heat coming off of that parking lot um, exacerbates the amount of water loss that that tree has. And then of course the pollution um, indexes are increasing, although here uh, recently because of the uh, um, coronavirus we've seen a, nip, a significant improvement in our environment. So uh, I guess there are some advantages to some adverse things that happen in our lives. So let's get down to some site considerations. Uh, one of the important things that we want to look at is pH. pH has an impact on not just plant health, but how vigorous and vital that plant is. Now, if you live in Indiana, soil pH is typically on the basic side or the, the right side of seven. You can see down here in the bottom corner, or excuse me, the bottom of the, of the um, scale here, seven is neutral. Remember our basic chemistry in school. So seven is not so bad, but once we get to the right side or the basic side um, or slightly alkaline side of that, that's when we start losing availability of plants. So plants, when they get the moisture in their root zone, then they have a, a chemical solution with a lot of nutrients that they have to mix with in order to be taken up by the plant. Well, some of them aren't available because of the pH. If we've ever seen um, chlorotic pin oaks or uh, river birch that are yellow or, or even maples with um, intravenal chlorosis. Oftentimes it's not a disease or a cultural practice or, or lack of maintenance. What it is is just the pH is not good for that particular plant and the availability of those nutrients. So we have to try to make adjustments or even better is select plants that are better, best for the pH that you have. So a soil test is very, very important. Where trees work best, 
both turf and trees is slightly acidic. Most of our, most of our nutrients, especially our macronutrients, are readily available in that five, or excuse me, 6.5 to about 7.2 um, is ideal. And anywhere above that, um, we can certainly expect some, some response from the plant that is not good. So soil type, soil texture makes a big difference. I don't necessarily concern myself with the soil type because really there's only one type of soil in the built environment and that's just basically crappy soil. Um, it's fragmented, it's often displaced as I mentioned. Um, sometimes they'll take the topsoil away when in a new subdivision never to be seen again and you're, you're left with basically B horizon um, hard pan to try to grow trees in. So the texture is real important. What we want to know is what are the, what is the mixture of, uh, or combination of sand, loam, and clay, sand, silt, and clay to, and, and see how they mix together because that will also affect drainage, water holding capacity, and other things that are very important as far as um, planting medium. Um, drainage is one of the key things as well. I often tell people the best way to check um, drainage is to dig a hole where you're going to plant your tree, fill it up with water. Come out and check it within the next four to six hours. If it's empty, um, then that means you've got decent drainage. Now the picture you see there on the upper right, um, that was a hole that we dug for a tree planting in Lafayette on Arbor Day, and that was filled up three days ago and you can see that the water is still standing there. So if we plant a tree in that particular location, we can expect some issues with the tree. Nothing like standing in water. Just imagine yourself, if you stood in a bucket of, five gallon bucket of water for two to three days, what do you think would happen to your feet? Well, roots are sort of like the feet of the plant and everything likes good drainage. You can see at the bottom right there, I've got that soil probe and I'm checking to see the drainage in, uh, in and around a tree that's been suffering. And it's not real clear, but basically that's just water mud that I pulled up with my soil probe. So understanding drainage, water holding capacity, which is what the acronym WHC represents, is very, very important. Also placement, it seems to be the biggest um, issue as far as sustainability of plants. Again, just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Oftentimes the location just doesn't support a tree. Um, this is at um, a retail establishment in West Lafayette. And you can see on the right there, there's a couple of trees planted in about a 28 inch, um, I guess, planting strip or mulch strip. Those are red oaks and red oaks get rather large. So you can imagine what's gonna happen once they get to a functional size where they're actually contributing some of those ecosystem services that we so desperately need, that's when they get removed and replaced. There's, it's basically a disposable plant. Here's another situation. This was uh, at a pharmacy in, in West Lafayette. Um, those are Austrian pines, which aren't, weren't too bad a shape for Austrian pines in Indiana, but they said they were having some roof problems. And I thought, uh, huh, I wonder why. Well, uh, I don't have another picture there where they were planted um, 18 inches away from the foundation of the building. And we know basically how big uh, Austrian pines get um, if allowed to grow to their natural size. So obviously once they get to a functional size where they're actually contributing something, um, they can't be removed, but they have to be replaced. Here's another one. Um, this is some star, beautiful star magnolias placed pretty well as far as um, bringing the scale of the building down and, and kind of giving some type of um, green coverage uh, to the side of the house that doesn't have any windows. Um, but there, there were some complaints about uh, perhaps an issue uh, with the uh, foundation of the house. Well, closer inspection, um, that's nine inches from the base of the home. So um, roots don't penetrate or actively, uh, actively penetrate any type of, uh, of uh, hard surface, but they will find a breach in that foundation. So if there's a crack in the foundation or a crack in the sidewalk or any other hard surface, they'll certainly 
um, exploit that in, ser in search of moisture. So they only grow where it's easiest for them to grow. Oftentimes, if you have a solid fir and firm foundation there, that hard surface will actually defect deflect the roots uh, laterally and typically not cause too much problem. But if there is an issue there, um, they'll certainly find it. This is one of my favorites. This was a newly landscaped uh, um, establishment in uh, Lafayette, Indiana. Um, uh, nice landscape, definitely well maintained. Um, but you can see um, the tree there that's staked, that is a tulip poplar. And I measured from the corner of the tulip poplar to the edge of the building, it was 11 feet. And obviously, we know how big tulip poplars get. And so certainly there's going to be some issues with that coming down the road. And again, once it gets to a functional size where it's actually contributing something, um, then to, as far as functional benefits, it's gonna to have to be pruned within an inch of its life or it's gonna to have to be removed. Um, the other thing too, I come from a landscape maintenance background as well, is I always wonder um, where you get those 11 inch mowers that mow that little strip between there, but that's another conversation for another time. Ah, oh, yes, and then uh, this is a common one. Um, you know, we buy these small evergreens. Um, this was a Colorado blue spruce. This was actually uh, my old neighbor, Bob. Um, Bob knew I was a, a tree guy and was in my garage next door working on my bike. And uh, Bob said, hey, come over and uh, see what I've done. And I said, hey, what you do, Bob? Well, he said, uh, planted a tree. I said, wow, what well, you got there? He said, it's a Christmas tree. Uh, Jan and, and grandkids and I are going to decorate it, you know, for Christmas and, you know, it'll be fine. I said, uh, I stepped it off and I st stood by the, the center of the tree and, and took one step and my nose was in the corner of the garage. I said, Bob, do you know how big those trees get? And he says, I'll prune it. I said, are you sure about that? I said, look across the street. So I don't think that's going to be a suitable type of maintenance input that's sustainable. So. Uh, Bob obviously wasn't very happy with me, but uh, he did move the tree to the backyard and provided some um, some a decent space for it. Also, though, I will caution people, especially in Indiana, uh, Colorado blue spruce are certainly not a good selection of evergreen um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, it's primarily, it's uh, mite issues and rhizosphere or uh, needle cast um, is a horrible problem and uh, very, very challenging to maintain. All right, this one I just got uh, here actually this week. Um, a lady sent this picture. She was concerned about um, uh, the quandary that she had with this Quercus or this uh, pin oak um, that was planted. They, it actually came up naturally um, about 11 feet from the house. So she was concerned about the infrastructure conflict. So really the, the, tree, the tree became an asset to the property and provided some shade um, for, the, for, the, for the home. Uh, but again, concerned with root, da root damage to the foundation. Again, only if there is a breach in the foundation. Um, also concerned about branch or tree failure. Roof concerns with the heavy shade, sometimes that can cause uh, some algae growth and some issues um, with with the late, uh, length of life of, of shingles. Um, and then of course, overall tree health with pin oaks in Indiana uh, can be a problem. Um, but, you know, that's uh, one of those things that, uh, again, you might have to have an arborist come out and take a look at. You see the bottom right there. Um, these are fairly deep rooted plants if the soil will allow and if the, um, if the foundation, this was built on a slab, um, should be able to deflect those roots, but rather than cut it down, it may be worth having a situation like this, to have an arborist take a look at it, perhaps air excavation, and um, prune the roots so that, and, and deflect them or direct them to grow away from the house or laterally to help there. Um, to go kind of along with that, they are also worried about their water pipes and sewer. Um, Really our sewer pipes nowadays are plastic and not necessarily that there's not a breach there. Um, but again, they don't actively penetrate um, sewer pipes or water pipes, but they will find leaks in the system and exploit those. Um, the roots are very, very strategic and very 
uh, capable of, of finding those roots that or those areas of high moisture, and they certainly can can find those. And then, of course, we have some people out there that just aren't real good with their design issues. Um, you can see this is an advertisement for a landscaper I found on the internet. Um, and you can see they have a very nice um, um, paved area there, but they didn't allow much room for the trees, although they didn't cut them down. But I can't imagine what the future of those trees, obviously the one to save them, they're an important as aspect. But again, um, one of those can, one of those kind of uninformed decisions uh, made and uh, certainly not good for long term for the, for the tree. So the other thing as far as consideration for tree selection is making sure that you know what's going on as far as utilities. And sometimes um, we think we know, but we don't want to take that chance. It's much too easy nowadays to, to make that phone call and uh, get those um, utilities mark um, and but you know we as a as a society we have constantly been complaining to the utility companies and our utility service providers to put all those lines underground put everything underground so we don't have those unsightly wires like you see there on the right well this is what you run into so if you want to make any improvements as simple as adding a basketball goal or planting a tree well, obviously in this situation, there's no way you could put a shovel in the ground. So it's good to call uh, and make sure that you do plan, uh, plan before you plant when it comes to utilities, um, especially underground. And you know, also be cognizant of what happens when you plant those trees in and around utilities. Um, the tree on the right there was planted in order to hide that um, very complicated network of wires um, with the energy company. but. Obviously, that what's going to happen to that tree once it gets to any kind of size? It's already in violation of uh, of ease or um, vegetation clearance. So, um, certainly not one of those things where the tree can remain uh, for any length of time. So, uh, we need to make sure we understand what kind of room we have uh, uh, underground, overhead. Are the transmission lines, distribution lines, uh, perhaps the primary feeds? Um, or are they telecommunications? Um, I don't know. I'm not um, a, a utility specialist and I don't know. So as a, an arborist and as an instructor for training um, early career and students, I tell them that they should think that every wire is energized and every wire is dangerous. So as a, if you're working with a pole pruner or you're a longer reach and you're, you know, sometimes those utility lines aren't very high, the best thing to do is just to stay away from them or get them disconnected before you do anything there as far as pruning goes. Now, as far as planting, again, they've made it so much easier with just dialing 811 um, and you can get all those things marked um, usually within a very short time and um, usually within 48 hours and we don't have to worry about any type of injury or, or, or worse um, it, whenever you come in contact with any of those utilities. And it can be expensive. And utilities have spent a lot of money. And honestly, I've worked with utilities for many years, um, utility foresters. And you know some of these guys are one of some of the most passionate tree huggers there are. Um, unfortunately, they have a responsibility and they have a, a mandates from um, national regulatory committees and federal and state legislation, which mandates that they keep a certain clearance. We all like our power and service and reliability is very important to everyone um, for not just health and safety, um, but for emergencies. And so when we plant trees, oftentimes we plant them in the wrong place or we think they have an unlimited growth uh, to the sky but we all know living in the built environment, there's a lot of utilities above, above our head. And we don't want to get into a situation where they come in contact, the tree could be energized, or it could be a, a, a way for a child to climb the tree and get in close contact with those. There's a lot of things that can happen. So that's why our utility companies and our vegetation management are so uh, passionate and so um, um, critical about how they prune trees because it's basically all about safety and minimizing risk to you. 
All right, enough about those things. Um, let's get on with the tree selection. Uh, again, making it sound real complicated, it's not. Um, going back to what I was saying earlier, if we know the what, then we, or the why we're planting, then we can certainly determine what we want to plant. So let's talk about the different types of nursery stock, of which there are several. Um, since most of our plants were bald and burlap as, or bare root, as you see there on the right, um, the two on the right, um, but after World War II, um, there was a lot of uh, changes, a lot of discoveries, a lot of research, and we have learned that container plants are um, about 45% of our stock now. Um, and also there has been some research that have the um, root control bags or root trapper bags. There's all types of nursery containers, infield um, plant, uh, root control uh, pots as well. So there's a lot of different types of things to try to improve the root system, which is one of the most integral and critical components of the tree and its, its abilities to survive in its new home. Um, all of them have distinct advantages and disadvantages, um, but I won't get into those um, this evening. But uh, most of the time, whenever you go to buy plants, you'll either get bald and burlap stock or you'll get container grown. When you go to the nursery to select a tree, it's kind of like anything else. You get what you pay for. And oftentimes, um, because of the convenience and sometimes the price, oftentimes we will see um, trees at the big box stores, not that any one is worse than the others, but uh, they're uh, much better at um, selling groceries and tools than they are trees. And you get what you pay for. So the best thing to do is select quality trees from a reputable source. Oftentimes they've been managed, they've been pruned, they've been fertilized and maintained properly. Um, where the branch infrastructure is much better and suitable for a long-term um, tree planting. Whereas if you go to some of the big box stores, oftentimes what they get from the nurseries are what we call part grade or kind of that second um, level of tree that the nurseries won't take. And as a result, you get poor branch structure, even poor selection. Um, we, and a lot of times you see a very minimal palette and oftentimes uh, they can be invasive. Um, I still see a lot of uh, ornamental pears at uh, some of these big box stores. I did go to one um, in Lafayette um, that did not have one ornamental pear in the nursery. And that's one of the first things I do is look to see what types of plants they have. Uh, lots of maples. Um, unfortunately, there's just too darn many maples. Uh, they're fast growing, um, but they're not a long-term, um, very sustainable tree. And also we run the risk of a monoculture and we didn't learn our lesson with ash and others. So um, unfortunately, uh, there's just too, too many of those. Uh, but um, one of the things that we, uh, we have to look at is, is what types of trees are available. And so again, oftentimes going to a nursery is uh, very, very important. And you'll get some uh, knowledgeable information about um, what to plant for your purpose. Also inspect the root system and the medium, um, especially on containerized trees. We often we're able to, to uh, pull the pot, separate the medium from the pot and take a look at the system and inspect to see if there's any girdling roots or if it's a poor root system. And also the trouble with, um, you know, with buying at the big box stores is you look to see where they're sitting. I mean, they're sitting on that hot asphalt. Um, they're not, they may or may not be getting water or the attention that they need that you'd see at the nursery. So again, the plant's already stressed out before it even gets planted. Um, so oftentimes we're planting a tree in decline and we just may not know it yet. So um, again, you get what you pay for. So be sure you use a reputable nursery or at least be knowledgeable about the plants you're selecting, especially um, their, with their health. I have to say a little bit about hardiness. Um, it's important to be sure that you have um, a tree that's hardy for your area. Um, the hardiness zones um, have changed in Indiana. Um, be certain that it is work that does work for your area unless you're uh, dealing with a, a, a microclimate. But basically the plant hardiness zone map um, is broken up into zones based on the lowest um, average temperature. 
and it shows central Indiana in 6A, um, which is about, I think, minus 10 to minus 5 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which, reg which is a bit warmer than it was back in 1990 when they changed that. So we actually lost a zone um, in the upper part, uh, northern, north, uh, western part of the state. So um, hardiness zones are changing. We're getting a little bit warmer, um, which could change the palette of plants that we're using. Um, but do be sure that they're hardy for your area. Again, like I said, most of the time, you're not going to find plants that, uh, that aren't going to be hardy for your area in the nurseries that, uh, that are serving, serving your location. So really, there's some critical thinking in this selection. Um, you want to make sure that you have the infrastructure for a sustainable planting. For example, make sure that, especially for municipal planting, uh, make sure that you have a minimum of a four to five foot lawn strip. Um, that'll support that plant. Um, it's all about soil volume. Um, think of soil volume or the soil planting area is sort of its canteen. So how much water it's able to keep in that area is going to make a difference in the survivability of that tree. Make sure they survive the location. Remember, think about the sun exposure. If you want to know what tree works well in your area, just go out and walk around in the woods. Good time to do it right now. Uh, things are starting to flower and leaf out. And we can see, you know, where do sycamores grow? Where do oak trees grow? Different types of oak trees. Where do maples typically grow? Where do we see red buds and dogwoods and things like that? Oftentimes in their native environment will get, help us to understand exactly where they will grow best in our particular situation in the landscape. Also be realistic with your maintenance expectations. A tree can be um, either a green asset or a brown liability. So if you don't have the ability to water, maintain it, monitor at least for the first year or two of this, during that critical establishment pay, um, stage, then your chances of survivability are not going to be very good. And this goes not only just for the tree owner or the homeowner, but it also goes especially for municipalities. Um, they, they, People spend, uh, administration spend a lot of money planting trees and oftentimes the associated maintenance that goes along with it is not a consideration in the budget and as a result, the trees typically don't survive for very long. So select pl plants based on how well they perform and not on their pedigree. Um, oftentimes, um, how popular they are dictates um, what trees we choose. We see, oh, the neighbors got this and the neighborhoods got that, or there, there's a lot of them at this store, so they must be popular and they must do well, but that's not always the case. Remember so the rules of supply and demand. So oftentimes just because they're there doesn't mean that's a good selection for your particular uh, community, your particular subdivision or your particular landscape. Um, one of the things that really kind of get under my skin when people talk about um, tree selection is got to be native, got to be native. Well, there is nothing native about the urban environment or even your subdivision or residential area. So native trees don't necessarily do well in the built environment. In fact, there are of cultivated varieties and other um, um, species that work very well or sometimes much better in the built environment than natives. We just want to make sure that they're not invasive and do your homework there. And anymore, there's a lot of attention going into the, the impact of invasives. And as a result, uh, we're not seeing near as many, but uh, sometimes um, we do see the ornamental pears out there and unfortunately people are still planting them. But again, don't limit yourself or your palate based on the fact that they're native. Um, what's most important is that they work well, um, work well for your particular location. And that goes with diversity. If you see a lot of maples in your neighborhood, don't buy a maple. Um, we just, some of us uh, remember uh, Dutch elm disease. Uh, back in the 50s and 60s, we planted uh, many, many elm trees. And then we had this invasive pest come over um, from Asia um, that caused the Dutch elm disease. We also learned our lesson just here recently with um, ash trees. We were overwhelmed with ash. A great deal of, of those um, have died as a result of the emerald ash borer, which came from Asia as well. 
So diversity is very important. Uh, trying to maintain a smaller qu quantity of a certain genus, species, and family so that if we do get an invasive pest, that it doesn't wipe out our, our urban forest. And make sure they're well defended. Certain plants, what I, what I call well defended, certain plants are just more susceptible to plant issues. And unfortunately, um, the, a lot of those plants are the ones that we like uh, and, and, and love to plant. Uh, for example, um, when we talk about pests and their maintenance associated with this, Pests attacks, attacks a genus, so they attack maples, they attack, they attack oaks. They don't just attack certain species of maples and oaks, they attack the whole genus. So regardless of whether you're planting a red maple or a silver maple or a red oak or a bur oak, those pests are going to attack those gen genus or those genera. So, and the, the pest really only becomes deadly when it's introduced to a new continent. And because of our global economy, oftentimes um, these pests become unwanted hitchhikers onto pallets or onto shipping crates and so forth, and they end up in the United States coming from China. And as a result, well, they're introduced as a pest to our, to, to our new ecosystem. But there's no native or beneficial insects here that keep that balance in place so that then they become an issue, that, such as we saw with emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer is everywhere in China, but there are a number of parasitic wasps that help keep them in check. And there's a lot of pests that we have now currently that aren't really an economic threat because there are some predators that actually keep them from becoming an issue. Now, if you look at the table there on the left, um, one of the, uh, we see that these are the species that are available. So for example, one of the worst is uh, prunus species. And you can see that there's 430 different species. Prunus is cherry. So there's 430 different species of cherry trees or related to cherry trees. And there's at least 326 known pests. So I'm not even sure how they survive, but I constantly get calls about what's going on with my cherry, quangin cherry, flowering cherry, all those things. And even look at some of our better trees like uh, Quercus, there's, but there's 593 species and there's 269 known pests. So these are some of our most popular um, genus and species of plants, but they're also the most vulnerable. So we need to think about trying to um, improve our plant palette, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so consider those non-native plants and consider those um, those genera, those species that have a limited number of, of uh, species, which means they have a limited number of pests. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Cladastrus is yellow wood, uh, Gymnocladus is a Kentucky coffee tree, uh, Liquid Anbar is sweet gum, um, Tilia is uh, basswood, uh, Nyssa sylvatica is uh, a sourwood. So, they have very few species, which means they haven't been cultivated to death or they haven't been introduced new species, so they have fewer pests. And so those are the ones that will, if we want to call something low maintenance, that's what those would be. So again, do a little homework and see what kind of, um, there's a wealth of information available on the web as far as you, you, if you're doing tree selection, um, go to um, Purdue Landscape Report or go to Morton Arboretum or Missouri Botanical Garden, which have very good um, um, resources. And they give you not only the information about the plant, um, but also about some of the uh, issues of concern or known pests that can be problematic in your landscape. So again, do a little homework. And if you want a low maintenance plant, make it based on on some of the maintenance that's associate, associated with it, which also includes pest management. So increase that, the number of uh, plant genera used in the landscape. Um, it's really an, a responsibility for the entire green industry, um, not just the homeowner choosing the plant, but you know, if, if we stop buying ornamental pear, the green industry, the nursery industry is gonna stop growing it. So, 
It's about supply and demand. Um, be cognizant of the of site diversity, especially again, some species just do better understanding the environment, um, the soil texture, and the, type, the water availability will make a, a big difference as to which genus you can actually pick. Um, and again, make sure that we know the diversity. This is just some um, pictures. This was um, a neighborhood in Ohio that I went to visit. Um, there were over 290 ash trees planted in this particular neighborhood and they lost every single one of them. Um, this was the entrance going into a subdivision um, in Fishers, Indiana, and you can see the majority of those trees were ash and many of them died as a result. Uh, the emerald ash borer um, basically lost um, many years of, of uh, tree plantings and a lot of money that has to be spent in not just uh, replanting, but removal as well. So, and of course, we're coming into that time of year where the ornamental pears look just absolutely stunning. Um, the white blooms are pretty much unmatched, um, but they escape the landscape. And this is what we see on our roadsides. Um, this is taken in Lafayette, just in a general field. And you can see they got ornamental pears planted at this uh, retail store and in the parking lot. But guess what? They come over into, and into the native environment and choke out some of our uh, more favorable species of trees and under and understory growth as a result of their invasion and escape from the landscape. So um, being invasive is becoming a major problem, not just with plants, um, but with uh, with other wildlife as well. So as I go with with selection to kind of be to coin the phrase of Stephen Covey and the seven habits of highly effective people, you want to begin with sort of the end in mind. Um, right tree, right place, planted in the right way. Uh, make sure proper planning for growth. Um, realize the space that you have there um, and plant. I see a lot of beautiful landscapes that have spent just um, an excessive amount of money, especially um, with understory and ground plane plants. We want that immediate finished look. And as a result, we overbuy and overplant and that creates problems. So, and also be pragmatic about the maintenance inputs. Do you have time to water um, once a week or sometimes twice a week, depending upon the species and the location? So again, think about the responsibility that goes along with getting that tree established. And even sometimes after they've been in the lawn for five to 10 years, they may still need water. The drought that we had in 12, 13, and 14, we're still seeing a legacy effect of um, that those that record 100 year drought that we had and the impact on some of our trees in, in natural woodlands and the urban forest as well. So there's lots of information available out there. Um, and if you go to the Purdue Education Store, um, there is a um, wealth of information. There's a FNR 531W is a what we call what we call tree selection for the end natural environment. It gives you a list of trees, some the utility friendly trees, and then Indiana native list. Then of course there's some others as well. Um, there's also an accompanying video that goes along with that. Um, if you want to to kind of look at it as well as follow along, um, talks about how to select trees. Gives a little more information about branch infrastructure and also um, choosing a good plant. With, um, with a good root system as well. So also kind of finishing up here, if you haven't subscribed to the Purdue Landscape Report, we put on every two weeks, we have a newsletter that goes out. We also have a Facebook page with uh, current and emerging issues regarding pests, um, new research and information that goes along with, uh, uh, with your landscape. It's information for the gardeners, the professionals, um, anybody that uh, is involved with trees and gardening um, or landscape, it's certainly a good resource. So I'm gonna finish up here, um, just a, kind of a quick prop. Um, we're gonna follow up next Thursday, same time um, on installing that tree. You've selected it, and now we want to choose um, the best way to plant it. I know we've been planting trees for over 2,000 years or more, and we still are learning more about that. 
And so uh, we're going to talk about some of the newest research that goes along with that. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and uh, see if there's, um, if there's any questions in the chat box. So uh, one of the questions that we have, is there any way to improve drainage in an area that will last in, a, in the long term or would it be better to find a new spot? Oftentimes we can improve drainage um, if, we, if we have that spot that we really want or it's really, really critical to the design of the landscape. Um, then a lot of times we can raise the planting area um, in order to allow better drainage um, or we can make some additions, amendments to uh, the soil or the planting area around it um, as far as the grade. Um, but there is, depending upon how badly um, the, 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 the drainage situation is, oftentimes that can be overcome. Um, and if anybody has any questions they don't want uh, that comes to mind later on, they can also email me um, at my email at Purdue. Um, another question here, I've got a couple of questions about um, um, EAB. Um, is it uh, too late or what if you don't have it? Well, there is a, a lot of trees that haven't had the pressure or have escaped. Um, but I would suggest, uh, depending upon where you live and the pressure you have, if you have an ash tree that's a, a, a significant element in the landscape, I would definitely get it treated. It's a lot cheaper to treat it. Um, you can treat every two to three years, um, and it's certainly worth the investment in keeping that tree. Um, and also think about the investment and time that you have in maintaining that tree. And if you lost it, the cost of not just removal, but the time it takes to get that tree back to parity with your lost tree. So um, every ash, every single ash tree, fraction of species, whether it's pumpkin ash, on purple, white, green, they are all susceptible to emerald ash borer. So regardless of the ash, make sure you protect it and get it treated. There's some information, uh, go to eabinfo.org on uh, treatment strategies and the best thing for your particular area um, or your particular size of tree especially, and um, that will help um, with, your, with your decision making there. Uh, next question is, how much does it cost for 811? Beautiful thing in life, calling 811 is free. Um, that's a public service that is paid for by your utilities. And so if you just call 811, give them their, ad give them their address, phone number, they'll come out and mark that again, usually within 48 hours. Um, there's another question here. Um, is there anything that our state or local level that leaders can do to outlaw the pear tree? <laughs> well, yes, there will always be outlaws. Uh, but one of the things that we are, um, we are uh, gathering some force with is uh, some legislation. If you look, um, uh, there's a new plant rule that went into effect um, called the terrestrial, terrestrial plant rule um, that the state uh, government of Indiana did pass that is eliminating some of our invasive species. So there are some uh, new laws and new, um, new ordinances going into place that does disallow some of those trees and especially ornamental pear has been one, has been one of those uh, um, very challenging ones to get on that list. Um, another question before we uh, sign off here. Um, is there a general rule of thumb of how far to plant a tree away from a home or structure? Um, yeah, there is. Um, a lot of times it depends on the mature size of the tree. And if you look at the plant tag or you've done your homework on that tree, oftentimes you'll see that uh, it has a mature height and spread. And so honestly, I go, I figure at least that or perhaps less because oftentimes um, whenever they put, uh, you know, say a height of 50 and a spread of 25, that's in perfect conditions. And oftentimes, uh, I'd say 90% of the time, we are in less than perfect conditions. So look at that spread and plan accordingly. So, and also if, think about the, um, again, the purpose. So if you're wanting the tree for shade, you want to make sure that you do get that planted in the proper location, um, not just 
distance away from the tree, but orientation to the sun. You realize, we, we all know that as we look through our windows, where the sun comes in changes throughout the year. So we want to make sure that we get it close enough. Usually for shade trees, we want to be within the 20 to 30 foot range of your home and those windows in order to provide that shade. Um, again, there's a lot of this information is in that publication um, that uh, that we just looked at or talked about earlier. Um, so if you have uh, if you have the opportunity to download that at the Purdue Education Store, uh, please do so. Um, questions on plants plant lists. Um, I don't like to do lists, but I will provide um, I will provide uh, a list of plants. Um, just because um, we've had several questions on that. So canopy trees, um, again, this is in the publication um, and also this will be archived and provided um, um, for you to look at later if you've missed something or came in later, had to leave early. Um, but ginkgo is certainly a good one. Uh, Kentucky coffee tree, sweet gum. Sugar maple is, uh, if you're planting a maple, that's one of the um, better ones again, every, every tree selection is situational. Also, if you like the appearance of sycamores, I highly suggest that you plant London plane trees, which is actually uh, Platinus acerfolia. Um, and the reason being it is less susceptible to anthracnose. The last couple of years, anthracnose, which favors a cool, wet spring, it has been the uh, the norm here the last two or three years, and uh, uh, anthracnose has just been uh, really hitting them hard. So, you know, these are some of the more common ones and also some of the less common ones to consider. Um, and then medium trees, the ones that are get less than 40 feet, um, these are probably not ones you've maybe never have even heard of. Um, but they're certainly worth considering. Um, but again, you're not going to find these at uh, the big orange store, the big blue store, and that kind of thing. So as a result, you may have to go to a nursery to find those. But uh, uh, yellow wood's an awesome tree. Uh, black gum's one of my favorite, especially for fall color and spring flower. Um, golden rain trees, another one that has beautiful flowers in the summer. Um, so uh, there's you know a lot of a lot of uh, um, advantages to planting these and these also have a, a fewer pests than you'll find uh, um, on some of your others. Then your smaller understory trees, a little less of a pout there because there's not too many that stay that small. Uh, but again, Japanese tree lilac, I've found just, uh, it's, it's been around for a long time. Um, uh, ivory silk is a common um, cultivar of that uh, particular uh, species. And uh, it's performed very well in some very challenging situations. So I've recommended this tree in a couple of communities that says street trees, and I replanted them 12 years ago. I went back to look at them this past summer, and they were doing very well. So they're a pretty tough tree, and they have very similar shape to our uh, ornamental pear, same flowering type, uh, flat, white flower about the same time. Um, so another good uh, selection that seems to be performing well. Love red bud, it's a nice native, but so susceptible to verticillium wilt, which is a soil borne organism fungus that is very challenging to manage. Uh, service berry is an old standby that uh, has uh, fewer pests, um, good for birds, um, and also stays relatively low. You can get in standard or clump form. Um, um, Amermachia or Machia amaranthus. We've been planting several of those um, on, on our streets and parks in, La, in Lafayette, and they've been performing very well. Tough tree with very few pests. Um, not real showy, or but um, again, it's a tough tree that works in some tough conditions. So, again, those are some of the trees that uh, that I like to. Uh, recommend that may not be uh, may not be uh, available at some of those other stores so um, again yes this um, this re is being recorded it'll be available on the Purdue FNR extension website um, I'll be posting that um, here in the next few days um, so look for that um, again if, uh, if you want more information on events like this 
Also, again, on the Purdue landscape report or Purdue Extension um, Forestry Natural Resources Facebook page, you'll see announcements all the time. So, um, also somebody posted, um, if you're looking at the chat, the Indiana Terrestrial Plant Rule um, to help with, uh, with those questions there. So, it looks like we're about out of time. Again, I want to thank the Indiana Arborist Association and Purdue University Forestry and Natural Resources Extension uh, for helping with uh, getting this going. This is the first time we've done this. Um, typically, I do these at, uh, at, a, at a location near you live, but due to the uh, restriction of, of the virus, um, I'm planning a series of these webinars and uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be seeing a similar situation uh, next week. So hopefully this worked out for you and look forward to uh, talking with you all next week. Um, if you are a certified arborist, um, I will have um, your information. You should have put that uh, information in your registration, and I'll know from the um, um, I'll know the uh, if you were in attendance and for how long. So, um, thanks to everybody. Stay safe and stay well, and uh, hopefully we'll talk again next week.